Hey, we uh, we're gonna start with some questions from you guys, and then we're gonna plow ahead into section three four. Um, it's my understanding that perhaps sixth hour is gonna get eaten up for seniors by the bishop talking to you guys. If that's the case, we'll use Friday as like a day for work for you guys. But let's go ahead and plow through on the lecture today as if we had class, as if six hours going to have class. And if they end up a day behind, we'll just let you guys catch, or we'll let them catch up on Friday and you guys can have, or I'm sorry, Monday, whatever, the next class day. Um, so I think that sixth hour is going to, the bishop is going to take sixth hour to talk to the seniors about something. I don't, I don't, I don't know. But if in that case, the other Celt class will be a day behind because we're going to go ahead and do three, four. And if we end up, if I end up missing them, then we'll catch up on Monday or whatever. Okay. All right. Um, questions from you guys. Taylor? Can I ask one about the choice? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it was the question was Okay, let me just pull it up here so I can we can all look at it together. And this is the pokiest website that I have to use regularly. Hey, ooh, some people have already finished. And you want to look at 15. Okay. So it asks, is this the question here, Taylor? What is yeah. the slope of the, line, uh, of the line tangent to the graph, yada, 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 at x equals 1? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all we're doing is we're going to calculate the derivative and then plug in 1 to find the numeric value for that slope. Um, from the construction of the function here should be an obvious candidate for the quotient rule. Um, and if you do that, I think that should be exactly what you end up with. Um, is that... That's what I did. Okay. And then I got an answer, but mm -hmm. then it was the wrong answer. So I don't know where. Okay. So one thing that it's worth pointing out to you that this is a question you could do on your calculator immediately without having to do anything else. Um, now, this is not a calculator active multiple choice question, so you shouldn't be actually doing this. But if you were looking to just check, um, we could check this with our calculator, so alpha y equals, and I'll just type in the function. Um, oh, I bet I know the issue. I bet it's because we haven't done 3, 4 yet, and technically that's a chain rule problem. You're missing a negative sign somewhere, I bet, right? Yeah, I bet that's what the issue is, because that's a chain rule problem, technically, and you'll be missing that if you don't. Um, oops, I'm in the wrong category. But we can do, your calculator can do a definite derivative, so with respect to x, and then we're going to use, I typed it into y1, and the value's at 1, and I get this number, and you're like, Mr. Kulik, that means nothing to me. Well, it's multiple choice, so it's going to be one of these three. I can just check to see which one it is. So like 1 over e. Nope. Uh, negative 3 over 4 e. Nope. And then negative 3, or just one, negative 1 over 4 e. Nope. Uh oh. Oh, it was the second one. Oh, okay. Sorry, I just I was looking at the I was 
just being dumb. Yeah, of course it is. There it goes. So that's a that's a check that doesn't issue your or doesn't change your problem. But I think your problem is that we haven't done the chain rule yet. And to do the derivative of e to the negative x, you should be using the chain rule to do that. And that's probably why it's not working out for you by hand. Okay. Because, yeah, the answer I ended up getting was the negative 1 over 4e. So, yeah. there must have been something Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my suspicion as to what the issue is. And maybe after today, if we go back and try this one, it'll okay. work out nicely for us. Right. That's my fault. This is, I thought I had checked to make sure I didn't have chain rule things in here, and I guess I missed this one. Um, but if we finish through three, four, certainly we have everything we needed to do. I thought I checked all these, but that has slipped past me. Anyways, does that feel okay, Taylor? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Maya. Three point three. What page is that starting on? Do you have that handy? Um, yeah. 197. And you said page number 37? Yeah. Okay. So it says a ladder 10 foot long rests against a vertical wall. All right, so this is already starting to read like a, like a uh, something I'd want to draw a picture for. So I'll start. There's my ladder resting against a wall. Um, let theta be the angle between the top of the ladder and the wall. Angle between the top of the ladder and the wall. I assume they're talking about this. And let x be the distance from the bottom of the ladder to the wall. If the bottom of the ladder slides away from the wall, how fast does x change with respect to theta when theta is equal to pi over 3? Okay, so if I'm looking at this picture, I have an angle, I have opposite, and I have hypotenuse. So I would be thinking sine. Okay, and then it says, how fast does x change with respect to theta? So here we're looking for like dx d theta. Everybody okay with, with that verbiage? Okay. So I'm going to be differentiating with respect to theta. So I'm going to do like dd theta of sine theta, and then dd theta of x over 10. Okay. So the derivative of sine is cosine. And the derivative of x over 10 is 1 over 10. But there's something else we need here. Notice here, when I differentiated, the variable with respect is the same. But here, 
it's different. In that case, I'm going to be generating a extra term. That extra term or extra factor, that extra factor would be dx d theta, which in fact, though, is what we're looking for. OK with that? And if I multiply both sides by 10, then there's my equation for dx d theta. And if I plug in pi over 3, then cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Yeah. So I should get 5 and then whatever these units, feet per second or something, or feet per degree, or radian, I guess. And does that, did that match the answer that they gave you, Mia? Yeah. That is, okay, good. Radians. Well, it's, it should be radians, not degrees, because the angle was measured in, they gave us was measured in radians. Right? Does that feel okay? You're welcome. And and the again, the piece that would have been not obvious is this, right? Um, Mackenzie, sorry. Same section? Okay. Okay, for, for what values does x, or what values of x does the graph of f have a horizontal tangent? Okay, so for 34, a horizontal tangent, I'm going to be just looking to do solving this equal to zero, right? So all I need to do is do the derivative, and this is a... Um, should be an obvious quotient rule problem. So I'm going to have negative e to the x sine x plus e to the x cosine x, and that should equal zero. You good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll factor off the e to the x. Exactly, yes. 100%. 100%. We good here, Mackenzie? Now, since I've written this in a factored form, I can apply the zero product property. So I can solve the equation e to the x is equal to zero, and the equation cosine minus sine equal to zero. So to solve e to the x equal to zero, I'm just going to be taking the natural log of both sides. And this has no solution, since I know the natural log of zero is undefined. So that piece didn't give me anything. That's OK. Uh, so let's go to the other part. So to solve this other part, I'm going to add sine to both sides, and then divide both sides by cosine. And I remember that sine over cosine is tangent. So we'll do the tangent inverse of both sides. It 
Does anybody remember where tangent is equal to 1 at? Yeah, pi over 4. But how many times is tangent equal to 1? Twice. More than that. More than that. Infinitely, Infinitely many. So we're going to have to write this as kind of like a generalized solution. So in tan how first of all, what's the length of tangents period? It's pi long. Remember, sine and cosine are two pi, but tangent is only one pi. Okay. How many times in its period does tangent um, equal one? Just once. Once inside of its period. Remember the the graph of tangent is looks like that, right? That's one period of tangent. We have the y value of 1 just once inside of there. So this is just going to be at pi over 4, and then every period before or after, we're going to have also a solution. So I'll just write pi over 4 plus pi k, where k is some integer. And that is our only solution for, well, our only set of solutions for that, as the e to the x part didn't have a solution to it, which is fine. So wait, why did you put, oh, okay, I thought that, was, that before was nine. So. Oh, yeah, my apologies. My penmanship. Mackenzie, does that satisfy you? Did you get hung up on solving the cosine minus sine part? Oh, okay. Okay. Again, that's a deep pull back to Treg. Let's come back and remember all that stuff. But again, this is the hard part about the course is nothing goes away. All these things that we had to do before, we still need to remember how to do. And again, we'll keep, as I'm trying to assign things from the book that are light on calculus but heavy on previous learning things, so we have a chance to re redo these things and review them and talk about how to do that again, because um, it's been a little while on, you know, for a lot of these kinds of tasks. Like the calculus part was pretty easy, where you took the derivative and set it equal to zero. That wasn't hard calculus to do. The algebra afterwards was a little bit sneaky, though, because you had to remember stuff from algebra 2 and trig and pre-calc. What was the Uh, because I used the product rule. Okay. Because it was the product of two functions. Right, okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. so to find the derivative, I did the product rule. Alright. And then so this is the derivative of e and then the derivative. Of and then set it equal to zero. Okay. Because gotcha. it's a horizontal tangent. Right. And then solve for x. Okay, I got you. Uh Victoria, did I see your hand earlier? Same section? No. 3.2? Sure. And here we're just asked to differentiate, correct? Yeah. Okay. So here this should be 
a fairly obvious quotient rule problem, right? Looks like a quotient. So that is the numerator times the derivative of the denominator minus the denominator times the derivative of the numerator all over the denominator squared. Okay. So what's the derivative of b? Zero. It's a constant. The derivative of c times e to the x, just c times e to the x. The derivative of a is zero. zero. Oops, forgot the squared there. So what do we have? We have a c e to the x over. Why did this why did you change this Well, because it says f of x. So x is the variable. Anything else is a not is not a variable. If it said f of x comma a comma b comma c, then okay, this is a you know like a multivariate problem. So when I differentiate with respect to x, all of those others. I have to treat like a variable, but that's not the case here, right? It's just f of x, they're constants. Yeah, so, so anything that's not, so I think there's a mean that that's not zero. Yes, unless it said like f of comma, or f of x comma z, yeah. then that would tell you z is a variable. The, qu the place where it would get a little hectic is if you have something like so there the y is a variable also so there's so there when we differentiate you'd have to be a little bit more careful we'll talk about this specifics in section 35 though this would be a different kind of problem called implicit differentiation mm-hmm Okay, so if I have the derivative of 2e to the x, I can pull the 2 out front, and it's just the derivative of e to the x, which is just e to the x. Right, Victoria? Yeah. So anything multiplied by e to the x is that. Unless it's a variable. Any constant. If you had x times e to the x, then no, its derivative isn't just x e to the x. Right, that, one. that would have to do, you'd have to do a product rule with it. Okay. Right? So if you have something with a variable times e to the x, that's a product rule. But if it's a constant, it's just the constant times e to the x. Okay. Taylor. Part 25, in the denominator, there's a c over x. Yeah. Can we have to use the quotient rule on that, too, or just? I would not. Okay. Do you want to see how I would think about it? Yeah. Sure. OK, so looking at 25, um, first thing I would do is I notice I have a fraction inside of a fraction. So there's two things I could do here. One, I could just rewrite this as cx to the negative 1, where I've just moved that x from the denominator into the numerator with a negative exponent. Or I could multiply the top and bottom by x. That would make it like x squared over x squared plus c. I'd probably avoid doing that because now I'm making the problem more complicated because the degrees are getting bigger. But 
that's fine to do also. Uh, but this is probably the way that I would want to do it. Is that okay, Taylor? Yeah. But either, either way, you should get to the same result. My suspicion is over here, you're going to have some simplifying to do at the end that I would prefer not to have to deal with if I don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, you could. It's just like this you'd have to use the quotient rule on right. unless you wanted to rewrite it as a polynomial right. where you could do the power rule, which I'd rather do so like because that's just, way less work. If you just did the power, oh, because it's a thing inside of things. So you yeah, you'd have to do like a quotient inside of a quotient, okay. which or I'd prefer to avoid if I had if I had the choice. The power rule inside the quotient. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. So like you can write it like that, and then once you get the first one, then you can put it back into a, uh, a negative one over it. Yeah. Kind of yeah. 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 You can move. You can kind of change the way you're thinking about the problem midstream if it helps you. Okay. Sure. Um. But in general, if I have the opportunity to write something as a polynomial, that would be my choice because it makes everything afterwards like, yeah, I just everything is much simpler if I'm able to do that. So as I simplify down, I get negative 2cx to the negative 1 over x plus cx to the negative 1 squared. And I'd probably just leave that as my answer. Why um, is writing a cx to the negative 2 in the middle? Uh, well, when I distribute this, I add the exponents. Add the so negative 2 plus 1 okay. becomes negative 1. Yeah. Yep, those are good questions. Again, I did the simplifying and didn't say anything. And if you didn't catch what I did there, it doesn't yeah. make a lot of sense. No, that's okay. Jackson. So you did the numerator times the derivative of the denominator. Oh, did I do that wrong way? Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So Jackson caught me. I goofed up the product rule here, or the quotient rule. Yeah, I, you need to stop me if you see me making mistakes earlier, guys. It's the denominator. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, that's what we did for the last. Did I do it? Oh my, guys! You got to stop me if I'm doing dumb stuff. It was luck then. Uh, well, there'll be a negative sign different. It would be. It'll be positive too. The first one squared. I just a typo. Sorry. That's fair. Just a typo. Yep, yep, yep. You caught me, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. So there we go. Negative sign difference. So we multiply x across or add x. Distributing. Yep. All right. From which section? Thirty-one. You say? Yeah,
So 31 says, find the equation of the tangent line to the given curve at the specified point. So first thing I'm going to need is the slope for my tangent line. To get the slope, I'm going to be using the derivative. So that's the denominator. times the derivative of the numerator, I'll just do it, minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator all over the denominator squared. So go ahead and distribute things through. So those guys add to give me 0, and then I end up with x squared plus 4x plus 1 over x squared plus x plus 1 squared. Uh, combined with this one to make a 1x squared. Oh, I see. And then we'll just evaluate at x equals 1. So I have, I'll just get rid of that, 1 plus 4 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 plus 1 squared. What? I have 2x squared minus x squared is 1x squared. 2x and 2x is 4x, and then plus 1. Oh, okay. Right? That's, that looks good. Elvis? You're talking here? Yeah. That's just another notation for a derivative? Oh, sorry, 1. Thank you, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the slope is 2 thirds. And then I have y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And that should be my answer. Given to me in the problem. Right, okay, okay. So you just plug in the rise. And then you got 2 over 3. And you plug those 2 into the x. And then derivative minus. Oh, you said. The point slope form. Right. Okay. So y. Minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Let's start three four. All right. So let's say that we have a composite function. We'll call that composite function capital F. And it's the composition of little f and little g. Okay. 
So the way we take the derivative of a composition function is we do the derivative of the outer function and multiply it by the derivative of the inner function. So this is my chain rule. That's how I'm going to differentiate composite functions and I'm just going to burn through a bunch of examples using the chain rule and maybe in combination with our other product and quotient and power rules that we've discussed to this point or trig stuff. Okay? So we're just going to do a bunch of examples now because this is the whole section is all about doing these derivatives. So we'll start with something pretty straightforward. So let's say that we have the composite function, the square root of x squared plus 1. So what are my two composites? What is my outer function? Yeah, the outer function is the square root of x, and the inner function then would be x squared plus 1, right? Because if I compose those two, if I plug x squared plus 1 into g of x, I get the original there. So everybody, can we see that, Elvis? What if the outer function is square root of x plus 1 squared minus x squared? Uh, so you're saying, what if it was this? No, the outer one is square root of x plus 1. The square root of You're saying this? Uh, oh, uh, well, the problem is that this is still a composite, okay. right? Like if, yes, you could do that. You could think about it that way, but it's still, that is still a composite function. So if you went to differentiate that, you're still have to use another chain rule to do it, which isn't getting us anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so the goal is you want to get your composites that you pick or the pieces you're picking to make your compositions. You want to be things that are easily differentiable, that you don't have to use another fancy rule to do, that'll just be like things that you can do directly. Like the square root of x is something easy. We just do the power rule on it. x squared plus 1, that's easy. We just do the power rule on it. So that's the why, That's kind of the reason I'm breaking it up in that particular fashion. Does that make sense? OK, so if I do that, I'm really going to kind of be thinking about it this way. So the derivative of the outside is a power rule. Everybody good with that? And when I do the derivative of the inside, that's a power rule. And then I'd probably clean this up because it's pretty easy to clean up. The twos will cancel, so I'm left with x over square root of x squared plus 1. Is that what that is using? That is using the chain rule. But so this was my f prime of g of x, and that was my g prime. So, Victoria, what I did here, I used the power rule to differentiate the outside, ignoring the inside. And then you multiplied it by the inside. And then I multiplied it by the derivative of the inside. Yes. That's the chain rule. Because when you did like g of x, h of x, and you like you take the two derivative of square root of x, it would just 
the square the derivative of the square root of x is one half x to the negative one half. Oh, I got it. So the derivative of g of h of x is that, right? Which is exactly what I have circled in yellow when I do the composition. It just takes a minute to kind of like get comfortable seeing it the right way. And once you can kind of see it that way, they just they go fast. The, that's the beauty of the chain rule is it's like you're just going to take something that's a complicated derivative and make two little easier derivatives. It, it makes life easier. Um, So what if we have f of x equals sine of x squared? What's my outer function? Sine. Sine. And the inner function? X squared. X squared. So the derivative of the outer function is? Der derivative of sine is? Cosine. Start with your flashcards. You need them. The inside function doesn't change. And then I multiply it by the derivative of the inside function, which is 2x. And I'm done. What's the outside function? S uh, sine. Sine x. Yeah, sine okay. x, so sine, whatever. However you want to say that is OK. And the inner is just x squared. Then why is it cosine x squared? Because the inner function doesn't change when you take the derivative of the outer. So if you go back and you look at the chain rule definition, I'm taking the derivative of f, but g stayed the same inside. The inner function doesn't change. You multiply the derivative of the inner function at the end. Does that, does that feel OK? Yes, sir. Is it like basically taking the derivative? Yeah, we don't have to. I mean, like, you, these should be, like, the goal is to make these essentially mental math problems, or just derivative of the outside times derivative of the inside. And they should be, they should be easy to do and quick. Um, here, let's look at this one. This is a good one. I'll make that 100. Now is this one you'd have is this one you'd have to do the chain rule on? Probably. No, I mean you could foil that out. Oh, right, right, right. But like who wants to do a binomial, binomial expansion that's gonna have 101 terms in it? So then would you do the outside x to the one hundred? Yeah, so you'd have one hundred times the inside to the ninety ninth. And then times the derivative of the inside. So 3x squared. And that's it. I mean, you could clean that up a little bit, but like, you know, it's just multiplying the 3 and the 100 together. So the power rule just lets yeah. you write out an and to a dot and then just like simplify it all the way down. The chain rule is a way to deal with composite functions, right? So this we could do, but it would require us simplifying that all the way down, which is a nightmare, right? Who wants to foil that thing up? Right, because we can just leave that as random. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. It's an oddly specific time. How about this one? Who says that we should be doing the quotient rule on this? You could, but I would avoid it. How could I avoid doing the quotient rule here? Yes. 
That's how I can avoid doing a quotient rule on it, correct? Since it's just one over, I can just write it as a reciprocal with a negative exponent on it. And now we can just chain rule this guy and there's no big deal, right? Derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. And I'm, you know, again, you could rewrite this to make it cleaner looking, but like the calculus is done. Right? Much better than having to grind through a quotient rule. Uh, Mia? I mean, well, it's not so bad, really, right? Like, it's going to be negative, and then this guy goes in the top, the 3 goes down there with it, and you could write this as, like, the cube root x squared plus x plus 1 to the 4th. That's the way it is. Before. But, like... I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go crazy about simplifying. And if you and here's the thing, on the AP exam, in a free response setting, unless they're saying show this derivative is equal to this, you don't need to simplify algebraically. Like the calculus is done at this step, you could stop. On the test, would you give us a problem like that and be like? I would just say differentiate and have all the different derivatives all mixed together. Yeah. That well, well, no, 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 and that's and that's the piece. That's the piece that like you have to be able to look at the problem and go chain rule problem, or at least this problem at least go okay, it's a quotient rule with a chain rule in it. Like that would be fine to do too. It's a little bit of a waste. You're taking the long way to do it. But it's still fine. You know, the previous problem you could go, oh, binomial expansion, like shoot me in the head, that's terrible. But you could do it that way. It would not be impossible. It'd be a hassle. It'd be a really long answer, 101 terms. It would, yes, it would take you the entire time to do it, which should be a good indicator that, like, hey, there probably is an easier way to do this. Um, oh, this is a good one. How about this? What's the outer here? The outer is x squared. The inner is sine x because what this really means remember when we do sine squared that's what it means right oh. that's what we really mean by sine squared we use that notation so that we don't have to write a million parentheses but that's oh. really what it means so when I do the derivative I'm gonna have 2 sine x times the derivative of sine x. Oh, derivative of sine is positive cosine, sorry. Yeah. Does anybody recognize that as something? It is something from trig. That's the double angle. That's also the same as sine 2x. You could do it as a product property. Yeah, you could have done sine x times sine x and done as a product property. That would be OK. I think longer than doing this, but not incorrect. No, but I'm going to give you this thing, too, that you gave me yesterday. Because I pulled that out for you. Yes, Mackenzie. So the derivative of the outside, move the coefficient down and subtracted one from the exponent. And then I did the derivative of the inside, 
Derivative of sine is cosine. Yeah, I understand. Okay. I I don't know. Oh, that's a that's an identity. That was the double angle identity for for sine. I don't think that again. I don't think that that's critical that you remember that now. But I wanted to point out that like, if it was like a multiple choice question, I could conceive them of doing something that sneaky, of like, hey, differentiate that, and then the answer is a double angle. I didn't. Okay, so what was it? The inside is here. <laughs> Why is that the inside when it's not? Uh, because sine is the inside. Right? I have okay. two inside to the okay. two minus one, right. and then times the derivative of the inside. Oh, okay, that's not the derivative. I see. I see. Right? Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, let's do some examples where we have to do a couple of these rules together. So who, when you look at this, what rules are we going to be using here? The chain rule. Chain rule and quotient rule. Okay. So on a problem like this, I would probably think of um, doing this symbolically first because it helps kind of keep everything in order, right? So there's my outer and my inner. So when I take this derivative, it's going to be f prime of g of x times g prime. Everybody's OK with that? And then for this g prime, um, let's say the numerator is j of x and the denominator is k of x. So when I do the derivative of g prime, that's going to be the denominator times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator all over the denominator squared. Is everybody okay there on what I've done? And the reason I'm going to do it this way, or often it's easier to think about things this way, is because the derivatives that I need are pretty easy to do if I've already, if I just do them on the side like that, and then I can just plug everything back in. So 9, and then g of x to the 8th, and then k of x times j prime minus j of x times k prime all over oops, k of x squared. Well, they're simplifying, which we certainly would do, because if you look at the numerator here, that's easy simplifying to handle. Right? You're just talking about like adding like terms. That is an expectation that I would have that you would do that.
So when you do that, I get five up there. So, And I'd say that if you left me that on a test, that would be fine. Is there a better way to write this? Sure. What could we do? I guess if we wanted to. The 9 and the 5 can multiply together to make 45. And then I could do the t minus 2 to the 8th, but I can take those 2t plus 1s in both places and put them together. So that's probably the simplest way to write it, but like I wouldn't mark you down if you gave me the other thing because the calculus is done. But this is okay, just to be clear. That's okay. Okay, so if I'm looking at this, what do you guys want to do? I'd start with a product rule, and then I'm going to need two chains, one for each piece of the product, right? So I'm going to think about this piece is like my f of x, and this piece is my g of x. So when I do my product rule, I'm going to have f of x times g prime of x plus g of x times f prime of x. Okay, with that. So f of x is 2x plus 1 to the fifth. g of x is a chain rule, so it's the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside everybody's okay there and then I have my g of x and then the derivative of f of x is a chain rule so the derivative of the outside times the derivative of the inside. And I would say that's fine where you're at. You could combine these two like terms or whatever, but that's fine otherwise. Um, yes, that would be fine. We'll do some more complicated examples again next time. So again, for, for Sunday, we need 3, 2, and 3, 3. And then the, don't forget about the practice AP questions.
Uh, you couldn't do that, but you could foil out the first thing, foil out the second thing, and then foil those together, and then just do it all as a power rule. But that's that's a pretty bad thing. Like the second's a trinomial expansion, which is to the fourth power is pretty difficult or time consuming, anyways. Uh, but you could do that. I would advise against that. <laughs> Hi, Enzo. Uh, 